Okay, good morning. Um, we'll make a start at this just because it's a 30 minute session and we have a bit to cover. So um, welcome. My name is Roshan Garvey from the Department of Technology Enhanced Learning. And what um, I'm going to go through today is um, accessibility in Canvas. So uh, essentially creating um, an inclusive digital learning environment for your students. Um, so I suppose one of the reasons why, why we're doing this is because our student population is diverse. Um, we've got students with disabilities, mature students, non-native speakers, students with different educational or cultural backgrounds, um, all sorts of reasons why we should provide um, a more inclusive digital learning environment. So as part of that, what we're looking at is things like um, the content that we share, as well as the digital environment that we create and that we we kind of use with our students. Um, I'm just going to pop off my camera for this session um, and I'll uh, just because we're, I'm on edge room here as well. My colleague Jeremiah is here as well. So um, if you have any questions throughout the session, please pop them into the Q&A feature there. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube as well, um, you can pop it into the chat there on YouTube. Um, so another, I suppose, one of the reasons as well why we do need inclusive teaching and learning content is that digital accessibility is now um, a legal requirement in Ireland. So the legislation is based on the web content accessibility guidelines, um, specifically uh, 2.1 AA, and it basically um, requires us to to sort of have inclusive and accessible digital content um, for, for all our users and particularly as well for any public sector body, any public website, anything like that where we have um, our users interacting with content and that includes our LMS. So here are in MTU, our LMS is Canvas. So all of that is, um, is is good reason that and our, diver our diverse um, student population is all good reason why we should have accessible digital content. What we're covering today is um, some practical tips for, for improving the digital accessibility of files and media. So that's the particular content that you're going to be sharing with your with your students. Um, I'm going to give you some examples of how to provide an inclusive digital learning environment through Canvas. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the Canvas digital accessibility software. You do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'm just going to jump straight into it just again. I'm just kind of conscious of the time and how much we have to cover. Um, so the first thing we're going to look at, look at is the files and, and media aspect. So um, I mentioned the legislation um, that we need to think about in terms of um, digital accessibility and web accessibility. So these are the web content accessibility guidelines. Now they categorize their um, uh, guidelines based on four principles. Um, they're known as the poor principles. So basically that the content that you share is um, perceivable, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, now, the only issue with that is that sometimes it's it's hard to kind of identify what comes under each of their categories or it's kind of hard to, to remember um, what exactly the, you know, the, the guidelines are. But typically the guidelines that we'd be covering here for files and documents as well as media are ones that are, are applicable also on any of the content that we'd be putting up onto Canvas, um, even if it's, if it's files we're uploading or else if it's content we're actually putting into Canvas itself say maybe through a Canvas page or anything like that. It also is applicable to um, Zoom. Um, if anybody is using Zoom for, their, for any online classes or any meetings or anything like that with students, um, this, this is uh, all of this would be quite relevant to it. Um, so the first one I'm just going to look at is um, files and documents. So I suppose the main thing here is to be mindful of the common accessibility issues. So these would be the ones that are part of the web content accessibility guidelines. The biggest one um, to, to be sort of conscious 
of is uh, structure. Um, just making sure that you have correct structure in your documents. Now, the good thing is that whether it's Canvas or whether it's, you know, um, a, a, doc a document editor, whether it's, you know, if you're using Word or Google Docs or anything like that, they would all have these kind of built-in features within them. So it makes it a little bit easier to put your content together. So when it comes to structure, what we're talking about here would be things like using heading styles to structure your document, um, making sure that you don't skip heading levels so that you go, don't go from, say, um, heading one down to heading three. Um, you know, sometimes this can be done if if the formatting looks a little bit nicer in, in the particular headings or you feel like it looks it visually looks better. But if somebody's using a screen reader or anything like that, it can be very confusing because it jumps between the the different um, the, st the structure, the organizational structure of the content that you're using. In Microsoft Word, it's uh, it's very easy to have it to have a look to see if your content that you've created makes sense. Um, so to do that, you can check the document structure using the navigation panel, and there's a screenshot of that over here on the right. Um, and it just helps you make sure that your content that you've created makes sense, um, that people will be able to kind of work down through the content in a logical pattern. Um, another very common issue that uh, or accessibility issue is the use of color. Um, so you need to kind of ensure that there's sufficient contrast between the text and the background colors that you use. Uh, there's a lot of kind of free tools that are available. This one is just one example where you can test out the color contrast of the of the content that you have. Um, it it can it sometimes happens, I suppose, if people are maybe wanting to highlight important information, or perhaps you have maybe an image that you're sharing or a um, maybe a PowerPoint uh, presentation where you might have a colored background and you put some text over it. So it's just a good idea maybe to check that there's enough contrast with it. These online tools are great for for being able to very quickly show you if it's going to pass the particular um, web content accessibility guidelines. You can see over here um, that you have the uh, WCAG 2.1, and then it's broken down into um, the different elements then within that. So if the contrast is, if, if there's minimum contrast, it adheres to the um, AA guidelines. So, but, um, it, it's just something to kind of be aware of. The other thing as well to be aware of with color is to avoid using color as the only way to highlight content. So this can often be done if you want to highlight something important, maybe people selected and they choose red. Um, so for anybody who's colorblind, anybody who's maybe printed out the information uh, in black and white, Anybody who's using a screen reader, maybe um, it, it mightn't show that this is actually important information. So it's just as simple as maybe putting in um, the word important before it or anything like that and not just having the color alone as the only way to highlight that 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 information. They're just some examples, really. Um, in terms of imagery, then you might be aware of alt text. So this is alternative text that's used to describe images. It also refers to kind of graphs or um, tables or things like that, anything sort of visual within documents. Um, and another useful thing about this is that Word and PowerPoint and Canvas and everything like that, they all include um, a tool that'll help you do this a little bit quicker. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to write alt text correctly. There's some guidelines on it in terms of you know, not saying this is an image of or something like that. Um, but it, basically what it means is that if somebody is using a screen reader, they can, the, the, the alt text, the alternative text will be read out instead of the image itself. As well as that, if you have a student or if you have somebody accessing your content who's on a slow internet connection, maybe there's an issue with the image itself, maybe it's broken, it won't show up properly, the alt text will at least be able to tell them what the image is about or if it is something of importance um, that they, they, they would want to have a look at or they would want to know a little bit more about. If the image that you use is only there for 
aesthetics um, or uh, you can mark it as decorative and that means that um, any screen readers or anything like that will be able to skip over it again if the image doesn't load be able to see that it's not that important that you need to maybe wait for it or, or seek out the image itself um, when it comes to links as well um, what they what the guidelines say is to attach meaningful text to the links just to make them a little bit clearer to the reader so rather than just pasting in um, a URL, which is often very long and mightn't make much sense to the reader. Um, if you actually sort of, you see the second example down there where you, you put meaningful text over it. So if a user is looking through it, they'll, they'll know exactly what that link is, where it's going to send them. Another thing people suggest for writing your meaningful text is to consider if somebody is looking at that link out of context. So maybe they haven't read the paragraph around it, maybe they're scanning it, maybe you have the link somewhere else on the page that it, if they see that link text, they know where it's going and what it's about. So that's a good way of kind of making sure that um, your your link is, is, is sort of meaningful. Um, the other thing that they say about links as well is to try and avoid saying, click here, um, uh, which is also, I suppose, useful for in terms of um, internet security as well like that. So just adding a little bit of a meaningful uh, title to it. Another one of the most common ones as well is to just is to use plain language. So that's to ensure that your text is written in a clear um, and simple voice, that if you avoid any sort of unnecessary terms or any jargon but if you do use them which is the case often with um, many uh, modules or anything like that that maybe consider providing a glossary or some place where a student can reference the term um, you know make sure that that it's it's sort of if you're using an acronym or anything like that that you have it all um, uh, written down fully, at, you know, at the at the top of the page or anything like that. But a glossary is something sometimes um, a handy one that people can use to refer to, and it can be often something that can, you know, you can copy and paste into different modules or year on year you can reuse. Um, particularly if it's sort of like technical um, information related to to the content or the module that you're teaching. The final common um, guideline relates to tables. So um, one of the big things with tables, if you're using them in your content, is to always identify table headers. So again, um, the software is very useful for being able to, to help you do this easily. Um, you can you know, select the, the rows and you can um, assign it as a, as a table header. Um, the reason that tables can cause issues as well is if there's nested tables or if you have merged cells, um, it can be hard for screen readers to kind of read this out in a logical order or in the order that it's 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 that you feel it's supposed to be presented. Um, another thing that is an issue as well is, is some people, particularly online in websites or on, you know, even Canvas pages or anything like that, people use tables to align content or to you know put in say if you want an image and your text you might put it in a table so that it'll continue to look how you want it to um, so so this should be avoided as well um, particularly if you have if you use invisible tables um, where you know you hide the the outline of the table and anything like that um, just something to be aware of and and um, to, to again just make use of the the formatting tools that are available within the documents and within the the system that you're using um, the last thing really here in terms of the files um, is to make use of available tools and technologies so for that what we're talking about is accessibility checkers in you know they're available in in microsoft word they're available in in um, powerpoint they're available in in, a, in adobe um, if you run those in the same way that you might run your spelling or grammar checks or something at the end of your of your editing process, run those and it'll help you to identify any of the issues. Canvas itself has accessibility tools built in it. There's the immersive reader. Um, there's you do it, which I'll be showing you shortly. Um, and, you know, all of these will kind of help in terms of trying to catch um, some of the elements that might be a little bit difficult to to identify um, another useful tool as well which is available um, 
uh, in the library, in the MTU library website is census access. So this is a file conversion um, software tool that was brought in by the library and uh, the disability support service. So that's available for staff and for students. Um, it allows you to convert a file into something that's a little bit maybe more accessible or um, a little bit um, more, sorry, my, my, I'm just, my Wi-Fi is, go, is going slightly here. Um, so something that's, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit more accessible or a little bit more useful. Okay, um, I'm just going to run quickly through the, the media elements. Again, I'm kind of very conscious of time and trying to get um, through all of these and give you a bit of a, <clears throat> bit of a view in Canvas. So in terms of media, um, what we'd be looking at is providing multiple op options for accessing digital media. Um, so here, things like adding captions to any videos. So that improves the accessibility um, for anybody who's um, using screen readers or anything like that. For anybody who um, maybe doesn't have audio turned on, you might have people, students who are looking at videos on the bus on the way to class or something. Um, all There's so many reasons why closed captions are useful for videos. So they are really at a minimum something that should be added. Um, it's something that we're we're in the middle of doing for, for all of our um, videos that are available on YouTube as well. So it's just something to, to add a little bit of an alternative to the, the media that you've you've included. Another option as well that's, um, a, that can be used for any uh, videos or audio or animation that you've added is to provide maybe a transcript. So this can be something that's just uploaded and included next to the, the media that you have. Um, and again, that can be something to help if people are want to quickly review something again if they can't access the video or you know they they might have um visual or auditory issues and just giving them that that alternative option as well there the final thing and i won't go into too much detail on this though is that the alt text again will come into it in terms of any of the the sort of the the images or the graphs or the in infographics that you use and again it's something that's available in um, the alt text kind of helper is available in any of your Word documents um, in your PowerPoint or anything like that. And it'll help you to make your images, anything, your videos or anything like that more accessible. In terms of Canvas itself, um, I just have a couple of things that I want to go through here. So the big thing with making your Canvas module as inclusive as possible is to guide your students to the learning content or try to do this in a few different ways. Um, so some of these are just some suggestions. They're just some tips that, that we have that might be useful um, that, you know, can help. It, it can also help speed up things for, for you as a lecturer. If your students know the best way to contact you, if they know the best or if they know how you are, would go about laying out your content on Canvas, it kind of cuts down on, on any questions or anything like that and just makes things a lot more straightforward for everybody, really. Um, one option that you could use is, the, is a, the homepage feature. So this can be used to kind of guide users and manage expectations as well. Um, so using this and kind of including like maybe a little bit of an introduction maybe letting them know where they'll find particular information. So if you typically put all your content in your units, um, you can let them know this. If you're using Zoom, where they'll, where they'll be able to find the links to the Zoom recordings, how you're going to communicate with your students, and then also how you expect them to communicate with you. So if you're going to use... Um, if you're going, going to use the inbox in Canvas, if you're going to be sending out updates in it through the announcement feature in, in Canvas, all of these things can be laid out in your homepage and give a student an idea of what to expect for your module. The good thing with something like a homepage as well is very often um, you will have, have the same way of using Canvas modules for, for your different subjects. So a lot of this could be copied and pasted into your different modules without having to change a huge amount. Maybe you might just need to change direct links within um, the homepage uh, text, but it might be useful as something that, that can be reused. Another useful tool is the syllabus. Um, so this is another feature that's available within Canvas, and it kind of helps to um, give an overview of sort of module specific, specific information. 
and it helps students to kind of focus in on key dates and milestones within your within the semester for this particular Canvas module. So you can put a little bit of um, information up here. Maybe you don't want to use the homepage, but you want to use the syllabus. You can again manage expectations through this. The students will have their calendar up here. They'll have any assignments and things like that. And they'll have a bit of a module summary. So if there's any due dates or any, say, Zoom sessions or anything like that coming up, they'll all be visible within that module syllabus all in one place, basically. <clears throat> The other way to guide students is to have like a consistent um, structure for your Canvas modules. So we often recommend using your units and maybe categorizing them based on week and putting all your content and all your learning materials or resources in those units. So using renaming the units to say week one, week two, you can have an introduction where maybe your home pages um, you could have uh, assessment overviews linked in up there into the introduction and then include um, headings under your unit. So you're able to further categorize the content that you're including in there. So you can see here we've got class slides as a heading. Then we've got class recordings and recommended reading is where we could put in any links in there. Another thing we um, to, to take note of is if you do upload a file, you're able to rename the file to add a meaningful title to it to make it a little bit easier for your student to identify the content and to, to find what they're looking for. Um, another thing as well is the navigation. So again, um, what we're lo looking at is maybe having a look at how the student views the content. Um, uh, the student view feature is really helpful here. So you can have a look at your um, Canvas module menu and see if there's any links that you're not really using. Um, and you can go into the navigation settings and you can change them around a little bit. Um, by default, there's some features um, or some menu links that we have turned off by default. So the people one is one of them. Uh, files is another one that we've turned off by default. Um, and then other ones as well. If you don't use them, they won't be visible to the student. But just toggling between the student view and maybe updating your module navigation to just keep it clear and consistent is a nice way as well of guiding students to the content. Another way as well that you can do that is by including module links within text. So, for instance, if you put out an announcement saying that you've um, put up an assignment brief, you can use the Canvas features um, where you can put in a module link and it'll help you quickly add in a link directly to that file. So again, you're just kind of trying to offer as much guidance um, and signposting for your student as possible. Um, another useful feature as well is the validate links in content tool. So it's just a case of kind of reviewing your, your content, uh, making sure all the links are working. Um, so this tool itself is very useful for doing a quick um, scan through your, your module content and making sure that all the links are working. Um, you can also run the um, accessibility checkers. Um, there's there's a bunch of different tools that you can use in the same way that you would. We were talking about finalizing, say, a Word document with your spelling and grammar. You can also do that in Canvas with these sort of last few checks. Um, another option as well in terms of kind of supporting inclusion is to support kind of community and collaboration through um, groups. So groups in Canvas are kind of ha uh, create a collaborative space for your students where they can do things like they can have a discussion area, they can, you know, um, upload files, you can put out pr particular announcements just to those groups. It's kind of a nice space to have them um, work together uh, within the Canvas module itself. So finally, just to summarize those, stay consistent. Use simple structure, simple language, simple design, and make use of kind of the student view and any of those sort of built in accessibility features within your Canvas module. Just very conscious of the time there, but I just want to um, show you the accessibility checker within Canvas. Um, it's called You Do It. Now, they do refer to it, I should say, as an accessibility assistant. And the reason they do this is because it, it isn't guaranteed to pick up every accessibility issue within your Canvas module, but it can help you to 
make the updates, make the changes um, that you're you're sort of looking to fix within your within your Canvas module. So it's a module level accessibility checker, which means that it's available within each module and it'll only scan that particular module. It's not something that's available to students, so only you can use yourself. Um, and what it does is it identifies the common accessibility issues and provides some resources and options for fixing those issues. And, and very often you can actually fix it within um, the accessibility assistance kind of panel um, within it. Um, so it, as I said, it, it scans for the common accessibility issues. So these are the ones um, based on the web content accessibility guidelines. So, so pretty much much of what we've covered here in the first part of this session. Um, but then it also categorizes the results into errors and suggestions. So the errors are issues based on those guidelines. And they're sort of ones that would most likely cause uh, an issue for, for your, your students uh, or for particular um, learners. Uh, suggestions then are things that kind of can help improve the learning environment. So they, they're they kind of on a hierarchy of, you know, the errors maybe should be focused on. And then the suggestions are things just to maybe bring it up a, a small level as well, if you have the if you have the time to do it. Um, so you do it scans uh, announcements, it scans assignments, quizzes. Now it only scans classic quizzes because those are actually native to Canvas. That's kind of the built-in Canvas qui uh, quiz quizzes. Um, so it won't scan new quizzes, um, but it'll scan discussions. Um, so discussion topics. It'll scan um, files as well. So that's kind of a new feature that it has. Pages, your syllabus. And it'll also um, scan some module URLs that you have within your, your module. Um, so again, like the, the common accessibility issues, your headings, your page structures, the alt text for images, obviously a big one, if you've got captions or anything like that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna jump over quickly just with the last bit of time that we have into um, a Canvas module. I'm just gonna show you how you would run that accessibility checker. Um, so this is the example that I used within the slides where we have a bit of a home page that's guiding, um, you're guiding your learners through the, the material. Um, and over here you have your accessibility tool. So it's just called accessibility. And this is available in all your Canvas modules. If you don't see it in your module navigation, you can go into settings and navigation and you can just drag it up here to this um, active area up here, but it should be on um, all, your, all your Canvas modules. When you click on it, it's going to load the tool and it's going to um, run, um, it, it will run a scan automatically when you, when you open it, um, but you can kind of jump back in on it um, again afterwards. It has some help articles here, um, a user guide and everything like that. Um, but some of the things that are quite uh, useful for it are it provides kind of ways to get started because it can be a little bit overwhelming if you run this. You can see here that this module has 193 errors. And as we said, errors maybe are the ones to focus on a bit more. Um, so this can be quite overwhelming. But what it does is it categorizes things um, and makes it kind of easier for you to focus maybe on specific problems. Um, so the most common errors, um, the one we, one of the ones we covered in our slides, which was avoid using color alone for emphasis. Um, we have the color uh, color contrast issues, and then no table headers found. Um, but I just want to focus your attention over here um, because this can be quite useful. Again, just if you get a lot of of errors show up in your module, um, you can sort of filter the view based on what's easiest to fix, um, what are errors only, so the kind of priority items, I'd say, any open issues. So this is a useful one if you're sort of slowly going through your module and making changes as you, as you go through it, um, you will, it'll kind of move things into um, open issues and kind of uh, resolved issues. Um, so you can filter that view. You can also view by issue type. So you get a drop down here and it'll give you um, all the the sort of the common issues you have there. So maybe you just want to focus on updating all the table headers. Maybe you just want to focus on 
um, closed captioning or things like that. Um, so you can filter based on that. So that's kind of useful. You can filter by content type. So if you want to just update all of your announcements first, maybe you want to update your pages or your files or anything like that, you can filter based on those. And then another one as well is you can filter by impact type. So this would be maybe you've found out you've a student who has like like they've put here visual issues auditory issues motor issues cognitive issues and maybe you want to quickly try and change as much as possible for that particular student um you can my sorry now my my screen is going a bit funny um so you can just filter filter based on that and it will show up um the results then that uh that would be most critical i suppose for that particular um issue um, when you so when you have chosen what, what whatever issue you want to do again you you can filter in this view as well the you fix it view um, and what you can do is you can click to review an item um, and what that'll do so this is actually a PDF that I'm I'm choosing to to review so if I click on that and it's showing me the issue and it's showing me the background color and the text color. Um, very often you can actually change um, the, the issue itself within this window. So it'll kind of show up and you'll be able to make your change. You'll see, say, for instance, the um, it updates here. So if I wanted to pick different colors, you can see how it's changing um, based on that. And it's making it a little bit easier. And what you can do as well is you can apply this to other identical issues and you can click save. Or if you want to um, make the change, say offline. So say you've you've identified the issue and you want to go away and make the change um, outside of you do it, you can kind of come back then and mark it as resolved. But if I just click on save there, um, that'll update the file. And the good thing about you do it as well is if you make changes to the files, um, wherever you have those files linked within your Canvas course, that link will update as well. So it's quite useful for that. Um, so you're not sort of going back then and having to change your your links within your Canvas course. Now, so I'm just going to close that for a second. Um, if you want to review the files that you've uploaded to your Canvas module as well, there's a specific area for that here. And what you can do here is you can see that the the issue here with the a lot of the PDFs is that they're untagged. So this would be a common issue with PDFs as well. Um, so you can review the issue itself here or you can make changes and you can replace the file, um, replace with a with a new PDF that you've updated or replace with a page or anything like that. And again, it'll update the link within your Canvas module. Um, you can also do the file conversion here as well. And something that's coming down the line as well with you do it is that once you've converted some of the say the documents or things like that that you have to other file formats those will also be available to students for them to download as well now if it's a case where you run the file conversion tool here and it say creates a html page from a pdf and you think oh look this doesn't look well at all it's not going to be useful for the student you can just um you can just delete that then afterwards as well so that won't be available to the student so you can just uh, do the file conversion and then leave the most useful um, converted formats there for the students to use as well. So you can do different rescans. You can have a look at reports as well for your module. So this will show you, you know, what's been resolved, um, bits and pieces like that. So it's kind of useful to be able to track over time because again, some of these can be quite time consuming, but it's you know it's kind of handy to be able to tip away at them maybe. Or like that, identify maybe some of the the more critical issues that that you might have. So that's a little bit of um, a whistle stop tour of the um, accessibility um, assistant within Canvas and some of the the sort of most common accessibility issues. Uh, just conscious of time again there, but. Um, just to sort of show you some some further information that we have. So we have our tell knowledge base, which is a lot of uh, guide, guidance and help articles and things like that on various aspects of Canvas, of Zoom and um, and the other kind of e-learning um, tools that we have available. 
we're always adding to these articles. So there's a lot on digital accessibility there and we'll be continuing to add to that. But we do have further support available as well if you want to contact us at edtech at mtu.ie. Thank you so much for your time. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them just in the last couple of minutes. I'm very conscious that people might want to, to uh, might have to jump away though.